welcome everybody to this podcast and YouTube video series presented by the Global Positive Health Institute. I am Dr. Liana Leonov. I'm the president of the Global Positive Health Institute. And uh, today we're uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Alan Weiss. Uh, he is the chief uh, medical officer of Blue Zones by ShareCare. He's the former president and CEO of a 715-bed healthcare system and was in private practice for 23 years in internal medicine, rheumatology, and geriatrics. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. And... Uh, oh, your area now is around blue zones and promoting the blue zones. Uh, some of our audience probably has heard about the blue zones, but uh, give us just a, a quick snapshot of what that's about and how you got involved in it. So it's all about prevention. We can treat sickness and illness and so on, but it's much better to get people well and keep them well than it is to do sickness. So over the years, uh, first as a private practice, and thanks for that very kind introduction, uh, I realized we had chronic diseases, rheumatology, geriatrics, but what can we do to keep people healthy and well? And then as a healthcare administrator for a big system, we again had the same problem. People coming back same, with same illnesses recurrently, be it diabetes or complications of hypertension. And over the years, I said, we got to do better than this. We can do prevention. But I didn't really know how to do prevention. Medical school and training teaches how to take care of sickness. And as a nation, we do that very well. But prevention would be a great idea. So shopped a little bit, went around, read a lot, uh, came across the Blue Zones, uh, went and visited a couple of communities where they were active. And lo and behold, people were living longer, people were living healthier, people were happier, uh, and healthcare costs were lower. So it sounds like a great idea. And we tried it back in Southwest Florida, in, the, in uh, Collier County, Naples, Florida. Uh, starting in about 2015, after about a two-year, three-year shopping experience. And over the next two years, we added six-tenths of a year of life expectancy for over 400,000 folks across the socioeconomic spectrum. So it wasn't just taking care of uh, already healthy and financially uh, affluent folks. It was taking care of everyone from the um, disadvantaged and uh, inland areas where we had uh, huge farm farmlands and um, all, all sorts of, of challenge resource challenge areas, but those folks also improved when they got into having a healthier lifestyle, a better environment, uh, working in the schools and the faith-based organizations. So the program works, and now uh, that program, uh, the Blue Zones Project, has grown to over 70 locations, over four million folks. And pretty much everybody gets the same experience. After about a year, the number, the very objective, the numbers start to improve. So now with our virtual and even, even this uh, podcast we're doing right now, love to have done it face-to-face -face and in person. But the reality is we can do a lot of things now virtually and change health and prevention virtually um, and metrically with, with real measures um, since most since most of the population is connected in one way or another to the internet. So the whole way of keeping people well and healthy has changed dramatically from certainly when I first started practice uh, back in 1977 till now, uh, it, it's, like, it, it's unimaginable how things have changed for the better, but we still have an industry that is based on getting paid on a fee for service. So when you think about it, and I'll just proceed for one quick question. As a physician, I, I loved chronic illness. It was, you know, and, and that's, that's loved in quotes. I didn't really love it, but I knew that patients were going to be with me for a long, long time, and I had to run an office and so on. Then as a hospital administrator, we would, and hospital administrators are very concerned about uh, market share and, you know, how many people are in, in their beds. They can't have empty beds or expensive so census is very important. Um, the insurance companies, the, even though they want it, they say they want to keep people well and keep the premiums down, what happens is the insurance companies get a percentage of their profit come, they take a percent of the of the money that comes in from their insurance premiums. So if they pay out a lot more money, then the next year they can raise the premiums and they get a 
a percentage of a higher number so they make more money. The device manufacturers, be it the pacemaker folks or the hip and knee replacement part people, they also do very well when, when there's, there's more sickness, they sell more of their, their materials. So you've got all, all of these groups. And then also, you know, I said the physicians, the hospital, uh, the insurance companies, uh, you can't forget the pharmaceutical firms. So one of the big, the, and the pharmaceutical firms are, should get credit for developing the vaccine so quickly and, and wonderfully. But their profits this past year and past couple of years and over the years have been just spectacular. So you've got all these five groups who live off of sickness. And we as the potential patients, we want wellness. So you got this dynamic tension. If everybody were paid people well, or happier and healthier lives, we'd have an entirely different system. You know, as I, I, I believe it was Albert Einstein said, every system's designed for the result it gets. Well, we have a system designed for sickness. We need to change the system. Now, Blue Zones is a, is a very smart, there's not one of the Blue Zones principles that's crazy. I mean, it's the, you know, have purpose in your life, have work-life balance, um, and, Eat reasonably. Don't oh, don't overeat. Go with a plant slant diet. Um, imbibe responsibly or not. Or actually, the latest recommendation from American Heart Association is not to drink alcohol at all. There was an some older paper saying that one drink was okay, and then really they're not so sure about that. But have friends, a faith-based organization. If you belong to any faith-based organization, you live four to fourteen years longer. That's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and then have family. Family is, is key. Uh, so, so you get those principles going, and then, and then obviously moving naturally, getting out and walking, exercising. You don't have to be a gym rat, but you do those nine things. There's nothing there that's crazy or unusual, but you start to do those things, and you've got a better chance of living to be 100. Uh, and certainly in this day and age, that's what we want people to do. It's, it's the right thing to do, but we've got to change the, the whole mindset of the, these five industries into keeping people healthy. They all will be winners and losers, and that's, that's tough. But ultimately, I think altruistic and motivated folks want to keep people healthy. Absolutely. And uh, of course, we have a number of followers that are part of the lifestyle medicine community. So the Blue Zones is uh, a community-based approach to prevention, but at the same time, it also is supporting treatment because these same, very same healthy lifestyles that we're talking about that you outlined so nicely, are uh, again, not only for prevention, keeping people well, but if they uh, do end up uh, having a diabetes diagnosis or heart disease diagnosis, um, if they can more intensively practice these healthy lifestyles, it will actually help to uh, at least uh, stop the progression of their disease. And if it's intensively enough, it will perhaps reverse their disease and treat their disease. And, uh, and we can't do that individually uh, we, uh, without a lot of help. And that's where perhaps the Blue Zones and living in a Blue Zones community can really help support that kind of uh, healthy lifestyles for treatment. And uh, one other uh, just comment as you were talking about the system and how perverse the system is <laughs> in terms of not really supporting these kinds of healthy lifestyles. Uh, and hopefully the new models and some of the models around what we're calling now value-based care uh, will help nudge the system in a direction uh, that are uh, really supporting uh, incentives to keep people well and to keep people on a track towards uh, wellness and well-being and, again, healthy lifestyles treatment. Uh, if there's a bottom dollar that you only get so much money <laughs> as a health system, you really then have that incentive <laughs> for lower costs <laughs> and uh, as well as perhaps in some uh, shared profit models, uh, you, can, you can even gain more money by keeping people well. And wouldn't it be lovely if there was more of that in our healthcare system? 100% agreement. And I'll give us, a, I'll share an example that's happening right now, uh, actually in um, Monterey, California, two competent systems and two competent leaders of those systems 
have gotten together. Salinas Valley Memorial Healthcare has been around for 70 plus years and Montage Health uh, previously had the regular dynamic tension in terms of market share, you know, who gets the, the open hearts and who gets the total joint replacements and the, the regular fee for service. And my, my healthcare system, we were involved in that also. I'm now embarrassed to say, but at the time, my board said, you know, what, what are the numbers? The, the finance committee would say, what are your numbers? Are you, you, get, you got to make a profit every quarter and you need people butts in beds, basically. Uh, so these two leaders got together and said, look, we're, we're the, we, we decided to get together with a Medicare Advantage program. And you mentioned pay for value. Well, the government's got Medicare Advantage. It's growing rapidly. The, the traditional Medicare is shrinking, um, Medicare Part A and B to Medicare Advantage. And I don't want to quote that. I think it's about a third to a little more right now are Medicare Advantage. But uh, those numbers aren't, uh, I'm not sure I'm right with that number. But it's growing rapidly and the, the traditional shrinking. So they said, look, we've got these Medicare Advantage patients. Let's see if we can get them healthier. It has, turns out to be a heavily Hispanic area. When sadly, uh, diabetes is rampant in, in that community, along with obesity and diet and whatever else, and probably some genetic uh, co components of that. So let's see what we can do to get people healthier. And we get them healthier. Then since we're getting paid per member per month, basically a, an annual fee, when you multiply it out, let's even get them healthier, keep them well out of the hospital. It's the right thing to do. All healthcare administrators and physicians and uh, non-physician providers and nurses and so on, we all want to keep people healthy. We really do. But we're given the tools to take care of sickness. So we're given the wrong tool for the, you know, we're, we're showing up a plumber's tool, but we really need an electrician's tool. So we need, and it, yeah, they're both trades and they're both similar, but that's what we want to do. So they got together and they've got a, they've got a blue zones program and they're adding um, life expectancy, they're decreasing the need for high-end health care. Uh, and on that, they're cooperating and it's going great. So that's just one example of these 70 communities. The community I was in, we saw the health care costs for our own employees and we had real numbers because we were self-insured, drop 54%, made, it was saved millions and millions of dollars, which more than paid for the program. And in fact, it was so successful that the county and the city and the sheriff's department and the school system all copied us. They were one year behind us with everything we did. So we had a smoking rate of less than 1% among our employees. We didn't hire new. And the next thing you know, if people word gets out that you're not hiring smokers, people who were on the border, oh, I wanna, they, they typically mentally want to quit, but just needed the motivation. They quit. And the next thing you know, um, you know, I used to brag that I can cure lung cancer. Well, how do you cure lung cancer? Get, get kids from not smoking. It's not that hard. It's, you know, cost a couple hundred hours to do an educational program to get a child not to start smoking versus about uh, $70,000 to take care of a woman who's got, who age 70 has lung cancer before she dies. So what would you rather do? Take care of somebody who's going to die of lung cancer or spend a couple hundred hours rather than $70,000 later on and have failure or a couple hundred hours and have success. And you get, get age appropriate educational material for late elementary and middle school kids and they don't start smoking. Absolutely, good point, well said. And uh, as we're talking about this again, the foundation of health and an ideal healthcare system is this focus on healthy lifestyles, uh, including not starting to smoke, a predominantly plant-based diet, being physically active. Um, and in the Global Positive Health Institute, we're very interested in the role of positive psychology and positive emotions to uh, really support and trigger those healthy behaviors. And uh, through the upward spiral of behavior with positive emotions, uh, the more one does uh, these healthy behaviors, the better one feels, the more one has positive emotions, the more with that, they're more likely to go back to those positive behaviors. So that's very foundational to everything that we're talking about is to kind of peel the layers of the onion is to 
how do we get, uh, we were talking about the healthcare system, but now shifting to individuals, how to get individuals to, to really be motivated and stick with those changes. And at the same time, uh, not only find them that they have physical health, but em emotional health and uh, mental health and every aspect of health, which I call total well-being. Uh, and there are a number of ways, of course, then that we cover in this series uh, to do that. Uh, and through uh, one of those uh, ways is uh, really around social resources and relationships. And uh, I know uh, from a little bit of what I've read and know about the Blue Zones, that the Blue Zones has really shown um, a beautiful stories and the cases behind uh, long-lived populations and their role of relationships in their lives. Uh, and uh, I'd love your, for you to comment and expand on that. Yeah, hu hugely important. So uh, loneliness is as bad as diabetes in terms of uh, morbidity and mortality. So people who have friends, people who connect uh, long-term, and when you're young, and I'm thinking about children's age, fifth graders, and we, you've got, uh, I've got grandchildren, you've got a child, uh, they have many, many friends, and they'll go through many, many friends. So that they're, they're uh, relationships that are shorter term, the school changes, the classroom changes, but you get, as you mature, you end up having lifelong friends. And then you get lifelong friends, fewer, but much deeper relationships. So the people who have had significant relationships, friends, uh, live longer, better, and happier than those who don't. So it's, it's very important to develop those uh, relationships and understand what's going on because without them, you, you're at a real disadvantage. The tremendous amount of research done, done on loneliness and friendships, uh, and it, it's all, it's all, always comes out to the same result. Um, and there are so, and then some people are extroverted, introverted, and you know, you, you, you end up matching up and be at interest in anything from book clubs to bowling. There's a book out, it's a little bit dated right now, called Bowling Alone, and it talks about how bowling leagues used to be busy and active, and on a weekday night, you'd have dozens of scores of folks getting together, and now you've got people showing up the bowling alley just by themselves, and it's, it's a whole different game. Game. You look at uh, some of these other, uh, and I look at the teenagers playing basketball or, or team soccer. Um, the other night I'm with my eight and 10 year old grandsons in between two activities that we had to go to a fast food restaurant. Not the, not the best choice, but it's like convenient. We had a tight schedule and it's a treat. And in comes a girls high school soccer team. And they're all happy and active and adorable and couple coaches. The restaurant was overwhelmed for a few minutes, but they handled it. Uh, and it's just great to see that. So those team sports teach people how to interact in, in the adult situation. Then you go to a healthcare situation and you've got teams of teams, units uh, ranging from, anything from a unit secretary to uh, nurse assistants, to nurses, to physicians, to physical therapists, to rehab. And they will have, and psychologists and psychiatrists, everybody's got to get along. And when you get a well-functioning team, you can walk into a nursing station in one second, literally one second, once you know what you, you had a feel for it. If the vibe is good or the vibe's bad, you know, if they're happy and interactive and, you know, smiling and so on, or versus, oh, this is a death march, you know, you know, they can be tired. It's the middle of the night. I get it. But it's just very obvious. And you see it's team sports, even professional sports, you can see when, and not that I'm an expert on this, you see the basketball players when they've got a whole team passing the ball versus a superstar and that, that team won't win um, because it, life is a series that's it's really an interactive beehive of activity that works well. So humans are the same thing and it evolved evolutionarily. The solo caveman didn't do so well because they needed someone to help protect and somebody had to sleep with somebody hunted or you had to bring down an elephant or what a mammoth, you had to need a whole team of folks working on that. Yes, and in positive psychology, we're, we're seeing that it goes even beyond what we think of as close friends or intimate partners or family, that it's really the community and that we can even have that kind of 
uh, positive emotion exchange, those micro moments of connectivity with strangers. But if you're living in, for example, I presume a blue zone community where you, you get a sense of that community and everyone being um, behind that kind of common goal of well-being and wellness, it, it probably is easier even to connect uh, with a genuine hello crossing the street or with the grocery store checker. Um, and, and not only that, but as you were talking about teams, it reminds me, I, I won't say which market it is, but I have a favorite market where they clearly get it about uh, the teams and the teams supporting each other. And as they support each other, the positive emotions just overflow. And when I walk in there, everyone just vibes with positive emotions emotions, whether they're stocking the shelves or they're checking me out. And it has the ripple effect so that when I walk out, I have a spring to my step, I'm happier. I get my healthy groceries and I've gotten a little extra therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's the culture of the, it's, so people have personalities, organizations have cultures. The, the food market you described has a culture that makes you feel happy. And now, and what happens then is you go back there rather than taking the mean supermarket and they do financially better and then they pass it on to their, and it becomes self, you know, it's classic. So the armed services looked at this, obviously, they, they get groups of 500 people and that's what's the typical size because that's what a leader can learn 500 names typically. And they want people to know each other. It just works well. So that's that's their size. And then they can see uh, so when you, and you get not that I know anything much about the Navy, but the Navy looks at that also. What's the ship like? Uh, what in terms of passing their safety and cleanliness and prepared for battle, you know? And it's a whole culture. Uh, same with the classroom. You just go in and you see a classroom with a happy teacher, and the kids are engaged and happy. And there's going to be a, a bell-shaped curve. But and same with the school, a school performance is about uh, 20 or 30 percent dependent on the principal in the school determines the, the psychology in the school. And that's a huge effect, not only on the kids, but all the, the kids' parents. So where your environment is, if you if you drop into an environment and make your environment a happy, pleasant environment, it's a whole different story than if it's like a, you know, tear yourselves apart uh, environment. I go back to my pre-med days, and I, I, I was very happy in my college, but the pre-meds are all trying to get into medical school, myself included. And we were friendly up to a point, but there were only going to be so many A's given out in organic chemistry. You know, it was just what the story was. You know, you had 20, 25 people, and the professor is going to give out 10% A's, maybe 15%. So you got 20 people there, and you know, got 10%. Not so good. Now, there's plenty of bees, uh, but you know, and you need it. So, you know, I'm talking to our uh, I've got a 15 year old grandson, and he's a very good student, and so on. And then talking to his parents, and they they tell me his grade point average is above a 4.0. And they, so I said, I got into a, a Columbia a College of Physicians and Surgeons, and my grade point average was a 3.28. Okay. <laughs> So talk about great inflation. And I, I was a good student. I, I was not the best in the class, but I was a good student. But, you know, a three to eight got you into a, you know, a, a named school. Uh, so it, it, but life has changed in so many ways. Having said that, it's the same story. If there are limited resources, we, re, we revert to an atavistic um, type environment. Uh, Lord of the Flies, if, you know, go back and see what happens when you get a group of boys and there's a, a whole hierarchy. And so, but in a resource rich environment, like the ones most of us live in the United States and even in poor areas, there's a tremendous uh, variation and disparity among wealthy and poor communities. Uh, but having said that, if you take the average and, and could spread it out and use it efficiently, we've got more than enough resources that no kid should go to bed hungry or not have a place to sleep. I mean, this is an embarrassment for a country like ours. It's just an embarrassment. Um, there should be good opportunities for everyone to get worthwhile employment. And really depends a lot on, on education and, and training. So there, there are a lot of jobs that are going unfounded now that are good jobs uh, just because people don't know how to do them. 
And with a little bit of training, a little bit of, you know, getting together, uh, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, the, the whole equity issue is, is yeah, a very it, important one. And we'll actually probably have a, another uh, podcast just really looking at that uh, with some colleagues because yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm looking at the time and we like to keep these short. So as we round out this podcast, video cast recording um, and uh, been talking about the blue zones and lessons from the blue zones and beyond around supporting a culture of of well-being. Uh, what uh, what are your favorite takeaways? What are some takeaways for uh, our audience, uh, whether it's for themselves or as practitioners with their patients? Don't accept the status quo. Be a change agent. There are opportunities to change what we do and change what you're doing for your patients. You don't have to stay in this milieu. Change the environment and be, be, a, be a, pro, a proactive prevention expert. The folks who are interested in watching this and following what you're doing, this, your noble work, are already motivated. There, there are ways of changing things, but what happens is we get caught up in the uh, tyranny of the present, in learned helplessness. Uh, we've, being, we've always done it this way, or we've had multi-generational poverty, so it's not necessary. We can do better. And that, that's really what I think is the take-home message. The other idea with this take-home message is that it does take time. There's something called cathedral thinking. So the, the, uh, truth, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was built over about 70 or 80 years. At that time in Paris, the life expectancy was 25, 30 years. So the architects who drew the plans never got to see the building completed. The men, I'm assuming it was men, who put, laid the foundation never got to see the stained glass go in. The, pe the people who did the flying buttresses and the wool never got to see the roof go in or be inside. So the beginning never, somebody built the library that I went to, and I'm going to help build the library that my grandkids or great grandkids are going to go to. So we've got to think as healthcare professionals uh, that we can build a future for not only our offspring, but the whole society that is different than the one we lived in the past. We got, and you mentioned inequities and, and inequality and diversity. Yes, but we don't have to accept that. It's not, we don't have to accept that learned helplessness. We're finally waking up to, we have the resources and the motivation to make a change. And I think now is the time uh, to start making that change. Thank you so much. And I just have to add a little comment as you're talking uh, and getting our audience hopefully uh, riled up to be leaders and to look to the future and to look towards the long-term future is uh, that one of the things looming ahead for us as a society is climate change. And that is also linked with healthy lifestyles and a predominantly plant-based diet. Uh, again, we'll be chatting about that on another episode, but that this is all linked uh, in terms of leadership, the way we practice, the way the ripple effects with others and the way they live, uh, not only for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, but really the long-term uh, future and survivability of this planet. So uh, what we're talking about is just so essential. And uh, thank you so, so much for joining us uh, today. And uh, maybe we'll bring you back uh, again at some point. Uh, any My last pleasure. comment? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. It really is heartwarming. Thank you so much. Take care and take care, everybody. We'll see you on another one of these uh, episodes of the Global Positive Health Institute.